Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm the last speaker of a very long day, and I, I like to think I'm a reasonably smart guy, and so I'm going to try to be especially brief here, uh, again, as the very last speaker. Uh, I do a fair amount of work uh, on um, trying to evaluate policies designed to keep guns away from high-risk people for the purpose of trying to prevent homicides and assaults and and crimes, but uh, I do a lot of that work with Dr. Daniel Webster, and he's he's covered uh, that ground fairly well already. So I'm going to go in another direction. That doesn't mean that I think that the um, that the research on homicide and uh, and other crime prevention isn't important. It is, but uh, but again, I want to go another another direction. You've seen this familiar pie of the 31,000 gun deaths in the United States. Um, every year. Uh, it's one of public health's contributions, though, uh, to consider this entire entire pie, not, not just any um, one slice of it, but in particular, and as, um, as David already alluded that I would talk to, to, to remember the, the suicides, the single largest slice of, of this pie, 19,000, uh, more than 19,000 firearm-related suicides. You heard from Matt Miller uh, this morning, that that's um, a, a little over half of, of all suicides. That, that's the way Matt likes to say it. Um, the way I like to say it is um, there are more firearm suicides in the United States than all other suicide mechanisms combined. Obviously, that means the same thing, but maybe it helps you to, to, to think in another way about the magnitude of the, um, the importance of the firearm um, suicide issue. So, um, so the, the number obviously uh, has fluctuated some over time, but less, less really than, than maybe some of the other major causes of firearm-related death. You see that the, the number has stayed between essentially 15 and 20,000 for, um, for 30 years, and that, that looks pretty different from maybe some of the other kinds of, of mechanisms. So we're clearly Clearly not there yet with suicide. That was the raw number. This is the the rate, and maybe, maybe disturbingly, both in the raw number and and in the rate is the little tail here, where we're starting to see uh, starting to see increases in the last few years in again both the uh, um, both the number and the rate. Again, as Matt uh, mentioned to you this this morning, there is just copious research, a very, very large amount of research showing again and again, the totality of which is that the presence of a gun either in the home or in the community is is ultimately a risk factor um, for suicide. That's that's pretty clearly um, well known. But um, but maybe maybe now, rather than thinking exclusively about guns as a risk factor for suicide, important, important work that, that has been done, we, we can now turn our attention to trying to think about how to reduce that, that risk, again, as others have, have said. Um, you know, there, a few years ago, I, for a project, I went to the Maryland Medical Examiner's Office and I pulled the files for every firearm-related hum, uh, probably suicide in Maryland um, for I think a one or two year period and, and read the, the files, which often included a police report, but the uh, ME's report and suicide notes and pictures. I mean, it was a depressing experience, obviously. But um, I couldn't, after doing that, I just couldn't shake the feeling in my, in my gut that, that many of these, based on their circumstances, many of them were preventable. But ultimately, that was just a feeling in my gut. And, and so we clearly do need research on the potentially modifiable circumstances of these firearm-related suicides, modifiable so that we can, so that we can interrupt um, those kinds of things. Some of these potentially modifiable circumstances, we, we can gather information from already from NVDRS, as, as David um, and others have, have mentioned. And that's great. And NVDRS is, is clearly important. But others will have to go beyond NVDRS, possibly to next of kin surveys or, or other kinds of, of research to try to get a sense for whether the type of gun matters, the, the make and model, handgun and long gun. But maybe even more importantly, when as again was described this morning, when was the gun acquired? How proximate to the suicide was it? And who who was the person who, who bought it or purchased it? And 
ultimately how was um, how was the gun stored? Uh, did the victim so have a prior history of mental illness? What was the diagnosis, the treatment? Were there comorbidities? Again, when I when I read all of these um, medical examiner case files over and over again, you you got the sense that if if a person's chronic pain had been managed adequately, or if Meals on Wheels had shown up, or if their suicide attempt hadn't involved a firearm, um, that uh, that ultimately maybe there would have been time to to intervene. Um, so, uh, what were the comorbidities prior suicide attempts, and did they, if any, and did um, they involve uh, other kinds of methods? And then, obviously, we need to think about other. Um, other individual and environmental um, factors. And we need to think about whether these kinds of risk factors, modifiable circumstances, vary based on the, the, the different subgroups that are at different kinds of risk. So, so young people, older people, uh, returning vets were mentioned this morning as a, as a high risk group. So, so we need to, to look at the big picture, but then we need to, to subdivide it as well. So, um, so that's my that's my first research question and, and area. My my next one is one that um, that really no one has talked about today, which I probably shouldn't say, right? Because you're looking for consensus recommendations. But, but nevertheless, um, this is the, the this is the trend in unintentional, if you prefer, accidental firearm related deaths over a 30 year period, uh, from pushing 2000 uh, in 1981, and it was around 2000, even a few years before that, to down around 600 now. Yes, uh, unintentional deaths are the smallest share of that, of that pie, again, down to 600 deaths. That's still 600, even today, that's still 600 lives, 600 people who aren't walking around um, who, who might otherwise have been. But um, I don't think we've ever satisfactorily explained this dramatic decline. And if we don't satisfactorily explain it, God forbid, we wind up back at 2,000 um, 2, deaths uh, per year. So it, again, there are many theories as to why this might, uh, might be the case. Um, there's, there's good, at least anecdotal, evidence that um, there have been changes in death coding by medical examiners and coroners over time uh, favoring homicide or undetermined over um, unintentional. Uh, there have been changes in household ownership rates, as we, uh, as we know. There uh, have been possibly changes in the types of the, the mix the, of, of guns. Maybe that would be aided, knowing some more about that, would be aided by the kind of surveys that were discussed this morning. Um, storage practices, again, there's good evidence that, that the child access prevention laws currently in place in about 18 states have reduced um, accidental gun deaths. But, but how are they doing it? Are they, are they changing storage practices? We really have no information about whether cap laws truly affect storage practices or not. Another group is going to talk about changes in gun design. Has that made a difference? Educational intervention, social norm changes and, and other law and, and policy interventions. So, so again, I know there's going to be a temptation for this, for this group to, um, to not consider unintentional deaths, but I, I urge you not to, not to forget about them. Again, it's public health's contribution to consider that, that entire pie, homicide, suicide, and, and accident. If, if, this line, if, this, if this line were in almost any other public health area, if this, were, if this were some disease prevalence and we didn't know why the, the decline had been this dramatic, I promise you there would be research in this area. And so again, I urge, I urge a credible explanation, uh, both so we can understand it, possibly replicate it, prevent the last 500 or so of these deaths, but also make sure we don't wind up back in the bad old days of 2,000 deaths. Okay, last. Last question is not really a research question, I admit, and so in some ways I'm cheating here. But, um, but nevertheless, I thought it was so important and recognizing that I was going last and that most other research questions would probably have been covered by now. I, I, you know, if you put a question mark at the end of something, it looks like a research question, right? So how can we ensure that, that there is a next generation of researchers to enter the field to answer these questions? No good 
it's no good posing all of these questions if we don't have young, smart people to answer them. And we've suffered through 20 years, 20 years now, basically, of, um, of a dry world where, um, where, as again, people this morning said, it was difficult to, to persuade your best doctoral student to go into this field, or even your, your colleague who was already an assistant professor and was looking to, to build a, a name and a career for themselves. So how can we do this? What, what are the mechanisms? And it's, and it's not just by saying it's important. It, CDC has mechanisms. If CDC uh, creates training grants, there are training grants um, in uh, many, many other areas. Why not here? And that could be both pre- and postdoc funding. There are, there are K awards for young investigators uh, that NIH has. Um, why shouldn't CDC have something, some mechanism like that, again, to, um, to provide stable funding, K awards, provide five years of funding for young investigators? Why not do that in an area that'll, that gives a young investigator time to, to build a career? If CDC is doing this intramurally, if there, if there are mechanisms for, for intramural research, again, that, that suggests that, that this is awfully important. And ultimately, you see my last bullet is really the only bullet of my entire talk that doesn't have a question mark at the end because it seemed to me incontrovertible that we have to send the message that this is an, a research area that's, that's valued, that's, that's stable, and you can do that with your report. So I urge you to, to do so. Thanks very much. Thank you. And I don't know if anyone else noticed, but Jan kept uh, referring to uh, talks from this morning when actually they occurred at 1.30, which gives you a sense of the length of the day, <laughs> or at least the perceived length of the day. Okay. Um, questions from the panel members? <laughs> 